This is Forensic Talk with Jim Kimball, all talking all crime. The dangerous true story of a young Iraqi recruited off the streets of Baghdad to translate for U.S. forces fighting in the most murderous areas, including Fallujah, becoming a marked man by al-Qaeda for assisting American troops. Tonight on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, Amanda Matty served six years in the U.S. Navy as a Russian linguist and intelligence analyst. Dal deployed to Baghdad in Iraq. She met and fell in love with her Iraqi translator, igniting international intrigue and scandal. And that's what her first book was about, for which she was a guest. That was called A Foreign Affair, A True Story of Love and War. And now she's back. Follow-on book. She delves deeply into her Iraqi husband's story. It's called Voicing the Eagle, the fascinating true story of a young Iraqi recruited off the streets of Baghdad to translate for U.S. forces during the Iraq War. Welcome back, Mandy. Thank you so much for having me back, Jim. And again, thank you and your uh, husband for the, all the service you've done. And by the way, before we get into a little backstory here, uh, where you're, um, you'd think a translating job wouldn't be so dangerous, didn't you? wouldn't you? You wouldn't. And, and at first, I don't think most of the translators thought it would be dangerous. But uh, in 2006, the Associated Press said it was the most dangerous civilian job in the world. Yeah, we'll find out. A lot of them were, were murdered, as considered traitors by the insurgents. But give us the couple minute backstory of your story, basically the first book kind of stuff. The first book, um, yes, I wrote them out of order. (laughs) The first book um, tells of how Fadi and I met in Iraq when I was deployed there in 2005. And then this book is basically a prequel to the first book and tells um, of how Fadi ended up becoming a translator. And there was a little controversy in between there, right, when you two um, had a relationship that I guess was considered prohibited, right, within the military force? It was. It was it was a gray area. It really wasn't <laughs> prohibited, but the fact that I had a top secret security clearance and he was a local national was definitely something that um, made some people nervous. <laughs> and I'll have to say what to me looked very unfair was that he was a very devoted, uh, um, basically working for the uh, the American side uh, with the Iraqi nationals, and he gets treated as if he's a terrorist when this whole thing happens. As we dive in, what does voicing the eagle mean, first off? Voicing the Eagle is kind of, I guess, a little bit of play on words in that um, Fadi was the voice of the U.S. soldiers. So the Eagle is the American military, the American Army and the Marines, and then he was the voice of them for the Iraqi people. Okay, how did he get recruited off the streets? He was uh, in his, his house in a residential neighborhood in Baghdad when a U.S. Army convoy rolled in just a few days after the fall of Saddam, and this is when they were going door-to-door looking for those weapons of mass destruction. And the convoy rolled in, and, and they did not have a translator. Um, and nobody in the convoy, you know, spoke Arabic, really. They were just given the, the rudimentary words on the plane over, pretty much, um, of, in Arabic, and they're they're going into you know these residential homes and they weren't doing anything wrong but you know they're patting down the women they're going into the bedrooms and searching through the underwear drawers and not being able to properly communicate it was building tension between the locals who didn't understand what was going on and why there's these soldiers fully armed walking into their wife's bedroom and going through her underwear um so there was tension building, and the captain of the convoy knew, could tell that, that things, things were, getting, were getting tense and, and something bad was probably going to happen. So he literally started walking down the street screaming at the top of his lungs, does anybody here speak English? Does anybody here speak English? And my husband Fadi happened to be a student at the University of Baghdad majoring in English, and he, he knew he was the only one in his neighborhood who spoke English, so he stepped forward. In fact, one of the benefits uh, that he brought culturally is that it's very insulting, I guess, in an Iraqi uh, household to put your hand on a woman even, much less, you know, knock the door down and run through the house. Uh, it is. I mean, and, and again, the soldiers are, the American soldiers, they weren't doing anything wrong by our standards. But, mm-hmm. of course, culturally, yes, you, a strange man doesn't go and pat down, you know, a, a Muslim woman, of course, by the Iraqi standards. So um, it's, it's really sad to think just, because of a lack of communication, how many firefights did break out simply because we didn't have enough people on the ground that could properly communicate with the locals. Key role he ended up playing. What was the impact of the fact that he was not Sunni or Shiite, but uh, Catholic? Um, well, it didn't really, it didn't really matter too much. <laughs> um, but it did, it did play a role. I mean, further on down the line, um, 
as far as, you know, of course, whenever he started working for a unit, they automatically assumed that he was Muslim. But right. he didn't go in, you know, with a, a sign on his shirt that said, by the way, I'm Catholic or anything like that. So they would usually find out a little a little while down the line. And, of course, everybody was always surprised, and they were always under the impression that Christians were, um, you know, mistreated um, under Saddam or, or, you know, and he, he would always try to bring to light that, no, that really wasn't always the case. <laughs> In fact, it allowed him to bond with the Marines in particular, I noticed. Um, uh, now, how about this? Um, Fadi worked at one point for uh, in Saddam's palaces, right? He was. He was kind of like a, 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 a rent-a-cop. <laughs> he was just a basic low-level security guard. Uh, that was the thing. I think another thing that was kind of misunderstood about the Christians is Saddam actually trusted the Christians uh, yeah. above and beyond even his his own Sunni, you know, brethren, if they weren't related to him, um, because he knew that the Christians were such a small minority that they would never try to rise up against him. You know, he knew that that was one, you know, group that he really didn't have to worry about any rebellions coming from. So he often placed Christians in positions of, like, palace security guards. His private cook was Christian. One of his right-hand men, Tariq Aziz, was Christian. Um, so Fadi was kind of just drafted you know they used to draft them young it's kind of like the the version the iraqi version of the boy scouts <laughs> um and and would you know train them and and offer them you know kind of like government career paths and security and, and stuff like that did i read this correctly interpreted that you know these uh, these u.n inspectors were coming into some of these um uh, palaces and areas looking for WMD weapons of mass destruction and that Fowdy and and the and the guards kind of laughed at that because they knew there weren't any well, I mean, he knew he had a good idea, you know, at the the palaces that he had been assigned to. He had never seen anything or didn't know of anything like that. Um, so, but he was, you know, he was still even when they when they came up um, and tried to get in the palace, one of the palaces where he was on on guard duty at. Um, he he wasn't going to let them in without permission. That's for sure. He was a lot more afraid of of his supervisors than he was of the UN. <laughs> Amazing. And we, we say that I think initially, uh, as a translator, he was offered $15 a day, and the average salary in Iraq was 6 to $10 a month. So it looked, yes. like, it looked like he was an investment banker almost relative to that. <laughs> I know. Um, let's amazing, move now yeah. to the uh, – he, he joins uh, – he gets uh, put with the uh, second infantry of the army in the Al Anbar province in Ramadi, right, which is another incredibly dangerous area. Begin to tell us uh, uh, the story. Well, after he worked for a few months with the Army in Baghdad doing the the door-to-door searching for the WMDs, he got transferred out to Ramadi, where he was working with the Army out there that was training the new Iraqi Army. We had sent over uh, drill sergeants, you know, U.S. American drill sergeants, over to basically run these mock boot camps for the new Iraqi Army that we were building up. And he uh, was the translator for the drill sergeants over there. That was his first position out in Ramadi. The, the, the insurgent population is growing faster than the number of guys they can train, right, to be in the, um, they call it the ICDC, I guess, the Iraqi new military. Right. It, it was first the Iraqi Civil Defense Corps, which then um, morphed into the new Iraqi army. And, yes, the insurgency was growing out in uh, western Iraq, mainly because when we, you know, disassembled the government, and removed the military, uh, we created that power vacuum, and the borders uh, went wide open. So most of the insurgents and the terrorists that were out in Al-Anbar province and in western Iraq at that time weren't actually Iraqis. They were foreign fighters that were flowing in freely across the border from Syria. And and, and you literally, can you, the the roads are uh, completely dangerous there, driving back and forth? Yes, that was the area that became part of what was considered the the Sunni triangle of death um, because of how dangerous, yes, the roads were and because the the whole area was just, especially at that time, just ended up falling completely under al-Qaeda control and they had checkpoints set up and um, it was dangerous for everybody. Um, Now, the translators become uh, transferred to a sort of an outsourced group called Titan, right, that ends up placing them, which makes them marked men, essentially, right? Well, they were, yes, just being translators, you know, made them marked men because the insurgency knew how vital the translators actually were to the U.S. mission in Iraq. 
I mean, the insurgents weren't stupid. They they had intel, and they, they could see how much the translators were doing to um, help bridge the gaps between the Americans and the Iraqi people who wanted to work with the Americans and, you know, kind of go along with the Americans. So they saw that that the translators were playing this critical role to our mission success. So that put them, um, basically made them number one targets. If you look at the insurgents now, they um, he, he moves to Camp Manhattan, right, from where he actually now becomes part of Army groups that are out searching for IEDs, um, as opposed to being in the training uh, within the camp. Is that right? Of course. They tried to bounce the translators around quite a bit okay. um, to, to kind of, uh, you know, so that their cover wouldn't get blown, so that they wouldn't get too known at a certain base by the locals um, and kind of for their protection. Um, so, yes, he went from translating for the drill sergeants, uh, getting bounced over to being with an EOD unit. And he didn't even realize he was with an EOD unit. He didn't know what EOD even meant <laughs> uh, for the first couple of days. Um, but he knows that he hated it. <laughs> Tell us what EOD, what EOD is. EOD, Explosive Ordnance uh, Disposal. Those are the guys that go out and, and hunt down the IEDs. <laughs> they I mean, go looking for them. And you're, I'm going to ask you to take us through uh, that a little bit. But I'll say that uh, somebody within the base, I guess, stole um, their, the identities of the translators on, on their files from Titan. And so there were pictures of Foudy all around the town so the insurgents could recognize him and try and kill him. Yes, there was actually a translator. He was actually from the U.S. He was a Palestinian, uh, a Palestinian-American who had taken a job stateside with Titan and had gotten shipped to Iraq. So he's, he's uh, uh, making like $120,000 a year. Um, and he was... Because he was an, I don't know if he was a citizen, but he at least had a green card. He had a little bit higher security clearance than, of course, a local like Fadi. So he was running one of the main uh, gates that they checked the translator's badges as they came in and out of the gate. Well, when he was checking the badges, he was sneaking them and making copies of them, photocopies. And then he was working with probably somebody on the janitorial crew on the base because he used to hire locals to come in daily, you know, just just this was winning the hearts and minds, giving them jobs and stuff. And mm-hmm. somebody on the janitorial crew was um, either with Al Qaeda or selling things to Al Qaeda. And, and they, he, he bought these photos of the translators' IDs that the Palestinian translator, you know, made and sold them to Al Qaeda. Wow. All right. Let's uh, take us uh, take us on a search. Uh, for the IEDs, because first of all, it, what's the temperature? It's like the, the conditions are like 120 degrees or something. Yes, it's ridiculous hot. Um, and, and I think that, yeah, you're stuck inside of a Humvee, Humvee, where you're not even allowed to go to the bathroom during the day. No, uh-uh. it's actually uh, for the IEDs when Fadi was assigned to the EOD unit, um, he was inside a Bradley tank. So okay. of course, the tank is sealed, um, and it's just like riding around inside a, a metal can. <laughs> um, it's hot. It's miserable. You can't see out. So uh, motion sickness is an issue. <laughs> um, and then, of course, uh, you're hunting IEDs. So you never know when all of a sudden you're, something's going to explode underneath you. <laughs> I guess on the basis level, you have to literally pee in a bottle the whole day in front, of the, in front of the other guys. <laughs> now, talk about what it's like searching for an IED and what the explosions, et cetera, and, you know, Humvees getting blown up and people getting killed right in front of people. Just take us along on a trip. Luckily, Fadi only had to do it for a few days, and that was a few days too long in in his opinion. Um, But it's grueling and it's miserable and it's loud. Um, They actually luckily didn't roll over the IED, but there was an IED that did go off near the Bradley that Fadi was in. And the funny thing leading up to that, he kept trying to talk to the guys in the Bradley because he had made friends, you know, everywhere. It was all the units he had worked with. He had, you know, tried to make friends, become buddies with the guys. I mean, he's a young guy. He's trying to make buddies with the young American guys. And he was really, really discouraged because every time he tried to talk to the guys in the Bradley on the EOD unit, they would never answer him. They would mm. ignore him. They would, you know, brush him off. He felt like they, they, he didn't exist, like they were trying to act like he, he wasn't there. Um, and then when the IED went off, um, it's excruciatingly loud, especially inside the belly of a Bradley. It's all metal. 
the sound completely reverberated, um, was magnified, and Fadi thought that he that his eardrums had burst. And then that's when he realized that everybody else in the Bradley had earplugs except him. <laughs> we'll see. And some... I think it was kind of an initiation. They. Well, after that, um, they were like, oh, you don't have earplugs? You know, kind of playing it off like they didn't realize they hadn't given him earplugs. And they're like, oh, here you go. And then from that point on, like, he was one of the team. Like, they, ha- he had to wait until he got his first IED before he became part of the EOD team. And then it was like the doors opened up. And then they were all chit-chatting with him, and he was one of the team, and he had survived an IED blast, and it's it's typical. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't uh, – that kind of initiation, I'd probably avoid it. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> now look at it this. Th- th- this talk about whether we, the, how we were winning or losing the piece. These examples of um, um, the IDIC officers, the new military they were training, were buying stolen cars for a thousand bucks and selling them to the U.S. for five thousand dollars cash. In other words, um, cars that you know that we'd already sort of taken over by winning the war. We were buying and, and reselling them back at a profit, and not, a lot of that cash even ending up in al-Qaeda's hands. Oh, tons of corruption. Lots and lots <laughs> of corruption. And, and corruption that, that, you know, they even our guys on the ground kind of knew about, knew what was happening, but it was kind of the least of our worries at that point in time. Um, the vehicles, you know, that what was happening in that case, yes, they were uh, vehicles that had belonged to Saddam's army, um, and then, of course, when we sent the Army home, these vehicles are, are sitting on these bases that are now not protected. Um, there's, uh, they've been deserted. These vehicles are sitting here. So the local population um, went in and, of course, you know, kind of took the vehicles <laughs> as their own. Hey, here's some, some, a good car sitting here. I'm going to take this truck. Um, the Army's gone. The base is deserted. There's nobody here. I'm just going to take it home. Um, and then, of course, when we rolled in a few months later and we needed – military vehicles, uh, the officers, of course, knew around their neighborhood, all these other people who had stolen these vehicles from the <laughs> former army base, said, hey, I can get you some military vehicle- vehicles. And, of course, we were more than happy to buy them back from, from these officers. <laughs> I'm always amazed how much cash the American, uh, the officers seemed to have on them that they could just hand it out like that. But he even says he, uh, some of them even knew they were being ripped off, but they felt it was better than um, the insurgents taking the cars themselves, so and it would you know buying them off, essentially bribing people to keep them happy. Pretty much, it was a lot about bribing people to keep them happy. I mean, especially I mean, Marine units and Civil Affairs units would go out with backpacks full, just stuffed with cash, just to to kind of buy our way. We were trying to buy the hearts and minds at that point in time. I mean, if there was a, a shootout in a Fallujah street or, or a Western Iraq street in your window took a bullet and burnt and, you know, shattered, we marched up to you and handed you 150 U.S. dollars for the window. Or if, if your door got busted down during a raid, please come let us know. Here's $200. If your car, if we bumped into your car when our tank was going down the street, come show us a picture. Let us know. Here, here's $300. I think it was just us trying to buy our way into them liking us. <laughs> now, Fowdy, who obviously knows the Iraqi people, knows the culture, is he looking at all this stuff and saying that, you know, we're, we're losing this? This, this, we're not winning any peace. Oh yeah, he was definitely shaking his head. Yeah. <laughs> he he said, "Oh my gosh, this this is this is pretty sad." Um, but you know, he tried to speak up a couple of times and was he was shut down. You know, uh, a lot of times he was shut down. Sometimes he wasn't. There were some uh, American officers that you know kind of that really listened to him and and listened to his perspective and his opinions and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I mean, he was a, he was a 22 year old college kid. And he he was happy to do his job. He was happy to do what the Americans had hired him to do. He was making good money by those standards. So at the end of the day, he was like, well, I tried. <laughs> and we'll see in the next segment. The uh, Marines uh, really seem to respect him. You've been listening to Forensic Talk with June Campbell. Next, we'll talk about working with the Marines. 
Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell announcing a new crime show on Mondays at 6 p.m. on 1490 WGCH. All talk and all crime. The nation's biggest murderers were the go-to source for the Moxley murder of the Skakel Appeals. Financial crimes on Wall Street. Inside the crimes of Russia's Putin and more. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories. From the host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, it's Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime. Mondays at 6 p.m. Right after the Lisa Wexler Show on 1490 WGCH and WGCH.com anywhere. We're back with Amanda Maddie. She's the author of Voicing the Eagle, a fascinating true story of a young Iraqi recruited off the streets of Baghdad to translate for U.S. forces during the Iraq War. And that young Iraqi is her husband now, uh, both in the U.S. Uh, can you um, tell us, he noticed, he got, he got assigned to the Marines, and you get a real sense that, that he just got a feeling about how different the Marines are versus the Army and the other branches. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, as we all know, the Marines are their own special critter. <laughs> and Fadi really, I mean, he, he got that, he got to see that firsthand, and he really did. He really connected with the Marines. The Marines were really the first ones that actually really took him in as a brother. He was one of the team. He wasn't just the local translator. He was part of their unit. And um, it really was a brotherhood with them. And to this day, the, the Marine unit that he worked with um, are the guys that he remembers, that he's still friends with today on Facebook, um, that he really respects, and, and he misses them a lot. <laughs> is, is, um, is it that the Marines are, are, are higher quality, recruited, um, that kind of thing? Well, why are they so different? It's a, just a different mindset. Um, the Marines, of course, have their own culture, uh, that is really, you know, just driven into every every recruit from day one, and they really do have their own mindset, their own culture, um, and it's their own little world. And they really accepted Fadi because they have a mission, and the the mission is number one. And there's nothing about personal bigotries getting in there. If you're one of the team and doing what what you're supposed to be doing, and and you prove yourself then it doesn't matter what color you are, what nation you're from, or anything like that. What was the base, the Marine base like, or, or his living conditions there? Um, on the Marine base, of course, they, they always give the Marines the bottom of the barrel, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't great. Uh, when he was on the main Army base, you know, at Ramadi, the Chow Hall was... It sounded like a Taj Mahal, yeah. It was. It was. It really was. And, and I even got to experience that, that myself. It was amazing, you know, the quality of food they have at the chow halls. <laughs> they rival any five-star restaurant here in the States. Um, so, and, of course, by Iraqi standards, he, he, he really enjoyed, you know, the all-you-can-eat buffet at the yeah. chow hall and, and the free Red Bulls, right? Um, yes. But, of course, you know, when you go to work with, for, for the Marines, it, it turns into to MREs and, and cold leftovers. <laughs> And it's yeah, it's it's hot, and it's it just sounded and the the, the and all the accommodations were just nothing um, at all like uh, where he was, um, but the people were were, were better. Um, they uh, now we're we're close to Fallujah now. Yes, there. Uh, he went from Ramadi to yes, closer to Fallujah. And um, this was right around when the black water, the yes. gruesome black water yeah. death We'll talk occurred. about that. What, what was, what, I mean, how did he even sleep knowing that he was basically in the most dangerous part of Iraq? Well, of course, he's, he's on the, the U.S. bases. You know, he's, he's in with the Marines. He's, he's surrounded by Marines. It's amazing how, how much safer you feel when you're surrounded by Marines, yeah. <laughs> even if you're in the middle of it. Um, but um, it was the, I think, probably one of the most difficult things was you got to remember, I mean, this is an I Iraqi kid, and he's now thrust basically living in an American culture, on an American base. Mm -hmm. He's um, eating with these guys. He's showering with these guys. Um, he's, he's sharing tents with these guys in their off time. So it was, a, it was a real culture shock for him. And then also, too, he's having to, to prove himself, uh, you know, on, a, on an hourly basis to, you know, new Americans. He's, he's the local Iraqi. In, he, he's in their personal space now. You know what I mean? Well, he also, they, so, trust, they yeah. trusted him enough to give him weapons, right? Uh, they did. Later on down the line, um, they did. And at that point in time, and he's not the only one. A lot of translators, you know, 
became trusted members of teams and that, that eventually, of course, became armed, especially when you're going into the hot zones like Fallujah. You want every person armed that is on your side. <laughs> Um, so tell us now, this he's in this six-man civil affairs uh, unit. Tell us what they do. Well, they were a Marine Civil Affairs unit, and their mission, of course, was to go around um, the little villages outside Fallujah and in western Iraq and try to help get them back online, try to, try to rebuild, help the farmers, you know, um, get their farms back up and running, um, basically just try to get life back to normal, help restore, you know, um, get them generators that a lot of they're suffering without power. None of the, the power is still out. So try to get them generators, try to get their water pumps back online so they can pump water from the river to their crops um, and feed their and feed and water their livestock and, and all that good stuff. Again, it was just part of our mission to win the hearts and minds. We said that we would rebuild the country and this Marine Civil Affairs Unit, that's what they were going to do. And they were very dedicated to their mission. What, what's six man unit, uh, and we'll talk the army support of them and stuff. But that seems like a pretty small unit, doesn't it, to be doing what they were doing? Well, their their job, of course, wasn't to actually go out and and rebuild the rebuild right. everything. They they were, you know, basically the the face um, and would be the ones knocking on the doors and having the conversations, you know, with the farmers and finding out what their needs were, and then they would go back and facilitate with the Army Corps of Engineers and the other, you know, Army units. Yeah, they could uh, hand the money out though. Right, and they, they did have the money to hand out as well. Um, part of their mission additionally was basically reparations, paying reparations to um, the villagers and the locals who had been, you know, who who might be allies to the U.S., but we just, you know, ran over their car, you know what I mean? So now it's, now things are a little shaky, so we're going to now give you money so you can buy a new car, please don't hate us kind of thing. Now, in this job, um, they did seem to get, and, uh, a lot of firefight action around them, and there are a lot of IEDs in the Army having to protect them. Um, in fact, he even thinks he got shot at one point, right? It turns out it was another Marine, but go ahead. Right, and of course, as the Marines are there trying to do their, you know, civil affairs job, um, and they're, you know, rebuilding, uh, more and more foreign fighters and Al-Qaeda are flowing in, and they're also, you know— th- the Marines and the Al Qaeda fighters are, are probably passing each other on the street. You know what I mean? Um, uh, the Al Qaeda fighters are coming in from Syria. They're going to a house in Fallujah, knocking on the door, and very respectfully asking if they can rent a room in the home for a few weeks and paying the people that live in the home, you know, an obscene amount of money, a thousand dollars. And this is Al Qaeda. This is Al Qaeda yeah. you're talking about. Yes, this is wow. Al-Qaeda, and wow. this is how they kind of infiltrated into western Iraq. They came in at first. They were very – they were actually, you know, low-key. They were polite. They were offering gobs of money to rent rooms and homes and stuff like that. So this is kind of how they bought their way in as well and really got a foothold in western Iraq. And then, of course, after – two months, the family, you know, says, hey, it would really be great if you, you know, left now. And then that's, of course, when they pull a gun on them and say, no, we're going to stay. And not only are we not gonna, going to pay you, um, we're going to offer not to murder your children as long as you don't talk and you let us stay here kind of thing. So talk a little bit about, I mean, they get attacked um, by snipers, right? A uh, fair amount of time, it seemed like, while they're out on this civil affairs work. Yes, and of course, Al Qaeda at the time they're they're becoming more organized. Um, the insurgents, the insurgency groups are um, setting up ambushes now, and they are systematically attacking. You know, it's not just random. You know, jihadists running out and and starting to shoot. These are organized attacks now, um, and of course, the civil affairs unit took several um, were attacked several times by ambushes and organized attacks and. Um, it was it was hairy. They're trying to do you know their their civil affairs you know job, but of course this is also why we sent Marine civil affairs units to do this job because we knew it was in a very hot zone. Um, now Fadi understood accents so that he could tell folks from different parts of Iraq and also foreigners. Right, there's guys from Syria, Lebanon, even Libya right. coming in. Did did was he able to tell when he was when they were dealing with a guy that was a bad guy or that a guy was that it was lying uh, to them um, that or could be an insurgent even that the Marines might just wouldn't be able to recognize? Oh yeah, definitely, and not just the Marines. Even even a native Arab speaker that's just from outside Iraq might not be able to pick up on an accent. It's kind of 
kind of close, similar to the difference between, you know, um, the way an American from Georgia would speak versus the way an American from New York would speak. Mm -hmm. Um, You can, we could tell, like, oh, you're from the South, aren't you? Or, oh, you're from New York or you're from Boston. Um, But, you know, uh, a a native English speaker from Australia might not be able to tell the difference between somebody from Georgia and somebody from New York. Whereas Fadi, that was another reason local Iraqi translators were crucial um, for for our military over there, because yes, they could you know talk to somebody for a few minutes and be able to pick out right away. Hey, this guy is is uh, not Iraqi. Uh, he's he's either Syrian or he's from Saudi. Um, or also too, they can pick up right away. Hey, this guy is from Southern Iraq. Why is he in Fallujah? <laughs> uh-huh. So you can start to smell who the bad guys are. Exactly. Now they saw a lot of atrocities, uh, atrocities and stuff in in Fallujah. Uh, Al Qaeda. Um, did the did the Marines, did the Americans, were they was there were a lot of atrocities that we were responsible for too? Um, as far as I mean, I wasn't there. As far as what Fadi relayed to me, he said that he personally did not see mm-hmm. that. He see, said that from his experiences being there for that first battle of Fallujah, that um, the army went to great lengths to warn everybody in the city mm-hmm. that we were the marines were about to come in and clear out the city if you are innocent you have a family you need to get out you need to get out now and they gave them several days um they surrounded the city there's a huge wall of, of u.s military surrounding the city for several days mm-hmm. um numerous uh uh you know leaflets were dropped um and according to Fadi, and he said, you know, they had plenty of time to get out of Fallujah, the innocent state. Now, of course, that, allowed the ins- that allows the insurgents to escape, too, right, when you give advance notice. Well, that's the thing, too. That's why they were, that's why we did surround the city, and we did have checkpoints. That the, 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 the Yes, that the, those coming out of Fallujah did have to pass through the checkpoints, and Fadi and the Marines were manning one of those checkpoints, and that was the reason. You know, they're, they're handing water, you know, to, to the civilians as they escape, and the reason they're handing water to them is because it kind of opens up the door. Here, let me give you some water. Let's chit-chat for a little while. And that that would be one of the ways that they would kind of screen them coming out instead of shoving a gun in their face, you know, and, and interrogating them. They'd, you know, approach them with water or food. They'd give them MREs. And then um, they were, you know, they tried their best to <laughs> to do it politely. Now, uh, you get the sense when there are these attacks, these Marines, they get their game face on. They get deadly serious. After this, the four Blackwater contractors are killed by Al Qaeda, they're hung from a bridge. How did that affect Fadi and the and the, the Marine group there? Of course, it was exactly like you said. They the Marines. It's amazing. They can flip. They can flip the switch. They can go from war face, you know, yeah. to to goofy guys in a matter of seconds. And of course, I mean, everybody in Iraq and everybody even stateside, you know, when that happened to those Blackwater guys, it was war face for everybody. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this, what the, this cash for, for buying, um, you know, buying support, uh, how it got, you know, how it just got abused, whatever. Talk about the police station that was bombed several times and we spent several hundred thousand dollars rebuilding it each time until they found out it was an inside job and that half the money was going to pay protection money to Al Qaeda. So the Marines were giving money directly to Al Qaeda. Yes, uh. Um, again, just part of the corruption, part of the disorganization, part of the miscommunication. Um, there's a police station over there that that um, the major that was in charge of the civil affairs unit that Fadi worked for saw this. This police station had gotten bombed twice. What is so? At first, he's like, "What is so special about this police station?" He's thinking, you know, there's got to be something that Al Qaeda wants this police station gone for a reason. What is the strategical pur- the strategic mm-hmm. purpose of this certain police station? And then they they find out down the line that it's actually just an inside job. The police captain that actually works at the station is is helping facilitate every time the Americans rebuild it. He he and Al Qaeda get together, and it wasn't. I'm not even sure it was Al Qaeda, but he and the local guys get together to bomb it to the ground and blame it on Al Qaeda, <laughs> simply because the guys that the the Americans were hiring local Iraqi contractors to rebuild the station. Of course, they're paying them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is you know like winning the lottery for this local 
con for these local contractors and the people the local people don't of course don't have jobs there's no economy right now so unless you were working for the americans or doing something for the americans you weren't going to make money so as soon as you built something and your contract was done, you didn't have anything else to build for the Americans. You were like, how am I, I going to feed my kids? So they got together and said, well, let's bomb it to the ground. They'll pay us again to rebuild it. It's, the story is amazing. And then um, uh, I guess Major Warren, who is the unit leader, who seems like a great guy, by the way, and treats Fadi very well. They're in yeah, there. And the is. guy says, well, it's going to take 400000 to rebuild the police station. And Major Warren says, fine, no problem. And Fadi's like, can't believe he's <laughs> handing out that kind of money. And then they find out that 200000 of the 400000 would go directly to Al-Qaeda so that they could get right. the, tru the trucks in. So well, by was, American standards, if you're thinking of building a police station, 400000 is is cheap, man. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, hey, that's dirt cheap to build a, a police station for. But, of course, that's, you know, <laughs> an obscene amount of money in Iraq. And Fadi re recognizes it as an obscene amount of money. And even the contractor didn't even try to hide it. The local Iraqi contractor like, well, 200000 of it's going to have to go so that I can get my yeah. trucks with the materials, you know, past the al-Qaeda checkpoints. And it was, you know, just common knowledge, you know, to, to the guys, you know, the the locals that live there, they, they understand, you know, that's, it's just normal life. You know, there's now Al Qaeda checkpoints that you have to go through and you have to pay these guys bribes if you want to get through with your stuff. Now, and of um, course the Americans had no clue. They're ambushed, um, at, at some point and, um, um, a lot of, uh, shooting, et cetera. And Fadi thinks he's been shot, right? Fadi did get shot. <laughs> Uh, Actually, you're well, right. He did get shot. Yeah. Uh, he he. There was one where yes, where he he did get shot. He but luckily he was wearing body armor. But he did take an AK round to the chest, right above the heart area. Oh, yeah. Um. But uh, the Marines. Um. Fadi was you know a a critical member of the team, and he always had one of the Marines was assigned to be basically his bodyguard anytime they were out on patrols. And again, another reason that he has such respect for the Marines, whenever the bullets would start flying, one of those Marines would use their body to shield Fadi from danger. Now, and um, it was amazing. We're down to the last minute and a half. When, to get from Fallujah to Baghdad, where his, fa his family loves, is, is it, it's literally impossible for him to have safely driven in a car, right? Yeah, at that point in time, it was dangerous for anybody to drive. And then now that he's a wanted man with his picture hanging up in mosques, yeah. courtesy of the Palestinian who sold his ID to the local Al Qaeda, um, he there, he just could not move. He he was he was stuck with the Americans. He was stuck between Iraq in a hard place, <laughs> um, and could not. He he really could not move. And so he ends up in the green zone, right? Take the last minute where he ends up. Well, he finally got transferred to the green zone, and he ended up. Uh, landing a job at the new Iraqi National Intelligence Service, which the Americans were building up uh, to try to get some some actionable intelligence flowing into the field for the military. And where you guys met. That's where we met. You listen to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Do, we'll get to our final segment in Iraqi American next. Back for our final segment with former Navy Intel officer Amanda Maddie. She's been sharing her husband Fadi's story. He was an Iraqi national. Um, you guys get thrown out of Iraq. I mean, he's considered, you're both considered traitors and all this. Tell us how he becomes an American and then he ends up working for the Defense Department back in Iraq. On, on paper, all they saw was that he was a local Iraqi and I was a U.S. Intel officer um, so the first thoughts of everybody stateside was he's using me for pumping me for secrets or he's, you mm -hmm. know, using, using me for, at the very least, he's using me for a green card. Right. They had no clue and did not take into account these years that he had been working, which is a reason I wrote the book, too, mm -hmm. is because before he and I even met, he had spent years bleeding on the battlefield alongside our Marines and our soldiers fighting for yeah. our cause over there and helping us and, and doing a, a, a lot more for, for our freedom and democracy than a lot of Americans have done. Um, so it was such a betrayal in my eyes, um, and that's why we 
fought and and I fought hard to kind of clear his name, not just clear his name, but kind of introduce and, and bring light to the things that he has done and what many local Iraqi translators have done for yeah, us. It's an amazing, uh, an amazing book. And it's, it's in the first book, even in his own neighborhood, people break into his house and, and try and kill him. And, um, and he, so he ended up translating back uh, in Iraq for a while, right? And then he's over here now. Um, uh, he's an American citizen, right? Yes, he is now an American citizen. It took me two years to finally get him over here, get a, get him a visa and get him over here. And, and after being called, you know, every name under the sun from terrorist, you know, to, to green card seeker, hmm. um, a few months after he finally got here on his visa, yeah, the Department of Defense came, you know, knocking on the door and said, oh, we'd really love for you to, to go back and be a translator for us in Iraq. And so he ended up, yes, going back uh, nine months after he immigrated here. He went back as a Department of Defense translator and worked uh, in northern Iraq for uh, another six months. Wow. Okay, let me, let's ask some uh, sort of legacy of war questions that I would ask him directly. Do, how, <laughs> how devastated does he feel about what's happened to Iraq? Does he feel the war effort was a failure? He's pretty sad uh, yeah. about everything. He doesn't blame us. He doesn't blame the, the U.S. Um, but um, the reason he, he came back after six months with the Department of Defense uh, working up in Mosul, and he just saw that it was just getting worse and worse and worse, and he, he, he quit. He came back. He came home. We had a, ch- a young daughter at that time, and he came home, and he got off the plane, and I picked him up at the airport, and he said, we've lost. He, in, and at that point, that was 2000 and, um, 2008. Wow. So he had been fighting since 2003 until 2008, basically, to, to try to rebuild his country and make his country a greater place. And yeah. it, he lost it. He, does he, he feel, felt like he lost the war. <laughs> did, he, did, the, did he feel the Americans over there get that? He does. And like I said, he doesn't blame the Americans. He blames he, he has a lot of blame for his own people that they couldn't, you know, get their act together. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the new government couldn't get its act together to to help re, to help the Iraqi people. It was just failures uh, down the line, you know, a multi, multitude of failures. Do, does he do we does he feel now that we have we handed Iraq to Iran in some ways? Uh, well, in the beginning, that's exactly what we did in that we had the really, really bad idea that because Saddam was a Sunni, all Sunnis are bad, yeah. and Sunnis hate Shiites, so therefore all Shiites are good. Yeah. And when Paul Bramer went in there and, and wiped everything out, they just basically decided, well, we're going to put all, all, all Shiites now in the government, and that, of course, just opened the door right up for Iran. What would you and Foudy say were the biggest mistakes we made, allowing that chaos um, after after Saddam went down or disbanding the army, the Ba'ath Party? What, what were the, the, the single biggest types of mistakes that we made? The biggest mistake, yes, was completely dissolving the Iraqi government and, of course, the military. We basically went yeah. in there and sent all of the Iraqi army soldiers home. And not only did we say, oh, you now ha- don't have a job, you have to go home, we, l- we let them go home with their weapons. So now they're <laughs> disgruntled, they have no money, they ha- their children are now starving, and we let them go home with all of the military weapons. So what do you think is going to happen after you do something like that? So Seems- yes, it, it wasn't, the, the Iraqi army wasn't loyal to Saddam. They would have been loyal to whoever would have been p- giving them their paycheck. We kind of had this misunderstanding that they were all Ba'ath Party loyalists and Saddam loyalists. And at the end of the day, Saddam was a tyrant, and he ruled with an iron fist, and these people were loyal to him because they had to be, and they needed a paycheck. Wow. Certainly um, misjudged. Tell us now uh, what, the, what the family update is. Uh, you're living in Ohio, I think. Tell us what, what you're doing, what Foudy's doing. Uh, no, we're in San Diego. We've been in San Diego now for a few years, and we have a, a 10-year-old daughter and a 2-year-old daughter, and uh, Fadi actually works in real estate. <laughs> we, have boring, we have boring American jobs now. He well, he was used to, going door, yeah, he's used to going door-to-door, right? So. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Now, now if you don't want to list your home, he, he's going he's gonna to bust your door in. <laughs> has he, how has he adjusted to – you have to read both these books to, just to feel the stress that he lived within, which may have felt normal – to him over there, but how is he, you know, addressed living as an American under a completely different uh, level of stress and war? Well, it's definitely culture shock, uh, first of all, but I mean, he handled the culture shock pretty well and, and adjusted pretty well, you know, to living here, but just like uh, the American soldiers that were, you know, 
subjected to that. I mean, he dealt with uh, a opposed- level of PTSD. Yeah, okay. He so he did. He yeah. did. How did how did he deal with that? Uh, he really hasn't. Probably, unfortunately, like a whole lot of you know the soldiers that have come home, he's he's kind of buried it. Um, he's I think he he's coping pretty well. I mean, considering, um, but I honestly wish he would get some professional help. <laughs> and, he, and he doesn't want to, or. It's one of those things you've got to be ready for it. And he, he, he addresses it. He acknowledges it. Um, but he's like, when I'm ready, I'll, I'll be ready. It's, it's still one of those things. Even when I was writing this book, it was very difficult yeah. to get certain things out of him. We'd have to, to take month, month-long month breaks between yeah. uh, certain things. I'd have to get him half drunk yeah. <laughs> to talk yeah, about Yeah, you told me that things. last time that uh, it was yeah. just so brutal for him. And he has nightmares and stuff like that. and. Um, luckily, those seem to have subsided quite a bit, but the first couple of years were rough. Wow. Well, it's a great it's a great love story, too, as well as a war story that you guys have ended up uh, so happy together. Are you going to get him? Has he given up smoking? In this book, all I hear is the smoke breaks all the time. No, and I will blame forever blame the military right. for introducing him to smoking, the U.S. Right. military. But uh, no, he still smokes like a chimney. See, we destroyed everything in Iraq. I know. Including their long-term health. I know. Well, uh, is this going to be the last book, or do we get you back? Is there, is there a part three? To this? I think I'm done for now. This this is it. These were the two stories I really wanted to tell, and um, this was the legacy I wanted for, for my kids. <laughs> I have to say, and really, the stories are beyond belief. You have to read it, both books. Um, I want to thank Amanda. Maddie, the book again is Voicing the Eagle, the fascinating true story of a young Iraqi recruited off the streets of Baghdad to translate for U.S. forces during the Iraq War. Also, there's a um, a charity, a nonprofit, right, that benefits translators that are that are still over there called NoOneLeft.org. Talk about that for a couple seconds. No One Left Behind. The website is NoOneLeft.org, and yes, they specifically help former translators who served uh, a minimum of two years with U.S. military forces in Iraq or Afghanistan get visas to come here if they're being hunted by Al Qaeda or the Taliban. And these guys were heroes. No one left dot org. You've been listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Our podcast available WGCH.com. Also YouTube version. Search Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell or Park City Productions 06604. We'll see everybody next Monday night with another edition of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell.